Hi there, this is Robin of Skeleton Notes and this is the fourth video in the vegan watercolour series. Um, as you can see, I found a setting to um, stop the flickery light effect, so that's good. It's only taken me four videos. Um, and I'm using a better microphone, so hopefully that's, well, it sounds better for you. Um, you might still hear some background noise um, one of the other studio members is a musician and is working today so um, if you hear some piano in the back room, background that's all that is it's quite a nice accompaniment really um, and as you can see it's warm enough today that I don't have the poncho on this is an exciting day anyway to get on with the vegan watercolour series part four and we're looking at brushes now Brushes is an odd one because brushes are at once the most obvious thing and also the thing which seems to be overlooked um, and not talked about all the time. Something of an elephant in the room, um, I think, in the art community. Um, so here we are. I was going to get a collection of brushes and a fork. Um, a collection of brushes. And the, the reason it's very obvious um, or could be quite obvious is that the the problem is really it's right there in the name um, if you have ever bought artist watercolor brushes then you know that oh there's a spoon as well um, if you've ever bought, if you've ever bought artists artists brushes before you know that they're usually described by what type of fiber you're getting and um, especially once you get out of the very beginner intro beginner and introductory price range into more um, intermediate student grade and professional grade um, brushes you'll notice that a lot of them will have names like Kalinsky Sable squirrel hair, goat hair, if you do um, oils you might get goat hair brushes or um, ox hair, badger hair even. And it's right there in front of us. These are brushes made from the hairs of these animals. Um, and yet it seems to get overlooked an awful lot, which I find very interesting and I'm not really sure why that is. Um, possibly we think it's just an outmoded naming system and that of course it's synthetic now um, but it's not uh, that, that's the thing uh, people who know their watercolor brushes um, once you get more into the hobby um, start painting more frequently um, and trying out different brushes a lot of people will decide that they prefer these animal hair brushes over synthetic brushes because animal hair brushes have very particular qualities which are difficult to replicate with synthetic fibers and that's usually to do with the springiness how much you can pull it, push it back and it'll spring up push it back spring back how well it holds a point how well it holds a point like this um, and how much water they hold and how easily that gets deposited back down onto the page. And as I say, um, for a long time synthetic fibres just haven't been able to match that. Um, and that is starting to change, they're getting better and I'll get onto that a little bit later. But first of all let's just address this issue of the fur being used. So. Um, the fur we're talking about in watercolour brushes typically comes from um, sable and mustelid, small mustelid type creatures, um, weasels, stoats and squirrel hair. Um, brushes which are named Kalinsky, um, Kalinsky sable are made from, well the sable, um, the Kalinsky sable is a particular type of sable which is found in very cold climates 
and the Kalinsky fibers are specifically taken from the tail of the the tail of a male adult of of that type. Um, now there's a lot of contro uh, controversy actually if you look into bushes and the naming of where Kalinsky is it's not a protected term so it does seem to get added onto a lot of different bushes um, with quite a variety of different fibers being used so you, we can't even say that well we need this particularly superior type of fiber for our bushes so therefore we have to get Kalinsky because actually a lot of the time when people are using Kalinsky bushes they're not Kalinsky sable, they're Kalinsky sable. Um, and they might be taken from different parts of the body, different types of sable, um, different types of mustelid altogether, including um, stoats and weasels. Um, so it's not always a guarantee of quality or of particular characteristics. Um, and as I've mentioned, other types of animals are used as well, usually these small ones, and the the fur is typically tapen, taken from tips of the ears, where it's very soft, um, and from the tail. Um, or they'll be combing out particular types of fibres because they want um, specific tapering or the length or a, a very narrow diameter, for example. Um, but let's talk about how this fur is obtained because it's not obtained from live animals. Um, it can be at times, but it's frequently not. Um, and there is a bit of a prevailing myth, which was once true, that sp specifically for Kalinsky sable, that they couldn't be kept in captivity. Um, so they were always trapped and killed and then the it from the wild um, and there's almost a romanticism to that and a justification that oh well it's a traditional occupation it's a traditional um, means of people making money by trapping these animals and selling the pelts that's simply not the case anymore um, they can be kept in captivity they frequently are kept in captivity the majority of fur that we're getting from them are from captive bred animals. Um, the hunting and trapping is a very tiny, tiny, minute part of that, of production these days. And as I've said, they are killed for their pelts. But we're only taking a very small portion of that fur. We're taking it from the tips of their ears and from their tails sometimes from the backs, depending on what hairs we're after. But we're certainly not using an entire pelt. Because even a weasel or a stoat, you're still getting a fair amount of fur. Um, you're, still, you're still getting a reasonable sized pelt from that. We're only taking a tiny bit of it. So what happens to the rest? Well, the rest of it goes into the fur industry. It's, well, it doesn't go into the, this is the fur industry. The rest of it gets used for things like hats and gloves, um, linings for things, anything where fur is used, where animal fur is used. So our brushes are a product of the fur industry. And actually saying it that bluntly is a bit, takes me back, uh, it takes me aback a little bit because we don't normally think of it in those terms. We don't normally like to think that we are contributing to and partaking in the fur industry and a good deal good number of us would never dream of bu buying a fur coat or real fur gloves or a hat because we don't agree with that industry and yet here we are using products of the fur industry so just think about that um you might be okay with that if you're okay with that that's fine you might know particularly where the brand of brushes you use sources their fur from and you might be content with the condition or the process of obtaining that fur. If that's the case, that's okay. It's not where I stand and it's obviously not where a lot of vegans and vegetarians stand and 
I would imagine it's something that a lot of other people would like to think about. But there's a problem. And again, this is something that is a bit difficult and but still needs to be addressed. Okay. Um, and that's the fact that the alternative to real fur is synthetic. And we've all become very aware in recent years about the problem of plastic pollution and in specific microplastics small tiny bits of plastic which can get into waterways um, which can get into the food stream which can cause all sorts of impact on wildlife and these are clearly very fine very small bits of plastic that we are using so how do we feel about that and where do we draw the line and it's really difficult because um, my veganism at least and sort of more traditional veganism that a lot of people connect with is to do with animal welfare and we know that plastics and microplastics that get into the waterways and into um, natural systems have an impact on wildlife so that's also something we, that we do need to be aware of and we do need to be careful about but then also I don't want to directly have animal products which I know have come from the fur industry which is an industry I don't support so where does that leave me or where does that leave you well I can't make decisions for you I can't tell you where to draw the line of what you are comfortable with but I can tell you how I deal with this and how I think about it. So I use synthetic brushes. These are all synthetics. Um, they're all very different types. <coughs> you can see I, re I use dagger brushes an awful lot. Nice big flat brush for mostly for putting down flat washers or wetting a page. Small dagger brush. They're absolutely ubiquitous. Um, number 12 round brush you can do so much with one of these um, a couple of small detail brushes all acrylic all very interesting all have some different properties to them so i look for higher quality acrylic brushes and they're not always super expensive um, i use the pro arts pro lean series and oh this is a fred alders brush uh, fred alders is a small artist supply store in the UK. It's only got a few branches and an online shop, but they make some really nice um, synthetic brushes. This is another, oh, this is a pro, um, pro art um, sword. It's all synthetic, very floppy. And I choose to use these. Now, as you can see, I've got a very small number of brushes and that's pretty much all my watercolour brushes save, except for my water brushes um, which and you can see they're quite grubby very well used I keep these in my little travel pouch that I take everywhere with me um, and they're also synthetic now so as you can see there is a lot of range available to me but I choose not to have a huge range so I'm not buying lots and lots of brushes and therefore I'm bu not buying lots and lots of tiny bits of plastic um, I'm finding the ones which are most suitable for me. Can you hear that? That's the fabricators next door again. Sorry about that. Um, and I'm careful with them and I look after them and I get the most use out of them as I can. So this means that we're not producing, I'm not contributing to a large amount of pl plastics being used. I'm not throwing away um, my brushes all the time. I use them frequently. Um, they're still all in really good condition. I look after them. I wash them, let them dry properly. Um, so you need to be letting them dry flat if you can. Um, and you can put covers on them to help reshape them. Um, but you want to avoid water sitting in this bit because that's where it, it can weaken the join and you'll get fibres coming loose and, and fibres getting out. And that's exactly what we don't want is fibres getting out. 
Um, so that's that's how I balance things is, yes, I do use synthetics, but I'm very careful with them. I'm very conscientious about what I buy. I'm very conscientious about making them last for a long time. Um, and that I'm not just throwing them into landfill. That's where we are. I've mentioned a few um, brands here, which you can look at. Um, Low Cornell, um, Pro Art. I believe Jackson's um, Jackson's Art own line. They've got some very good quality synthetic mm -hmm. water brushes. Um, the Fred Aldous that I use, Da Vinci. Um, da Vinci brushes, they've got some very good range, uh, ranges of synthetic brushes that I would recommend. Um, I haven't yet found any hand, yeah, I, there aren't really any handmade brush makers. Um, they could exist, I just don't know of them. They're very rare, they're probably also very expensive. Um, I also haven't heard of brushes being made out of other natural fibres like um, flax or bamboo um, but that's something I'd be interested in learning more about finding out if they do exist so if you know of anything like that please make a comment below that would be great um, I'm also going to leave a link down below to the mind of watercolor um, where Steve talks about um, who has a video on some synthetic water, uh, some, some synthetic brushes that he has tried out and tested, um, and I find that really useful and very interesting. So I will leave that to you. This is obviously something for your own conscience, your own ethics, um, to sit with, to think about, and to work out what you are comfortable with and you, what you want to do um, as regard to your watercolor brushes. Um, and I will leave it there. This is the end of the water, vegan watercolour series um, as we get to the end of the January. Um, I think we've learned along the way mostly that you do you do have to do research. Um, that is unfortunately a tricky part of it. It means looking at websites, it means looking at product descriptions, sometimes even emailing. There are plenty of YouTube videos out there with good reviews um, so keep an eye on those. And Normally it's only one or two ingredients that we have to look out for, but some of those ingredients can be um, very ubiquitous, which can make it difficult to avoid them. And I think we've also learned that I can't pronounce words, um, but that doesn't stop me trying. Anyway, I hope you've had a really good January. I hope if you have been exploring veganism for the first time, or you already are vegan, or you're only just taking up watercolour, um, whatever your story is, I hope it's going well and you're enjoying it. And I will leave it there and say bye. Um, and please visit my Facebook page um, or my Instagram, both at Skeleton Notes, and there's links in the description below. You can also support me on Ko-fi if you've liked these videos, if you found them helpful or interesting, then a small donation on Ko-fi goes a long way. So thank you very much and bye bye.